2020 has been a year, but thankfully it was a pretty great year for video games. IGN scored more games as masterpieces than any other year for more than two decades, though of course it wasn't all tens and gold stars. We also rated more games in one year at a three or lower, that's awful or worse, than we have in a while. So without further ado, here are IGN's best and worst reviewed games of 2020. Crusader Kings 3 is a superb strategy game, a great RPG, and a masterclass in how to take the best parts of an existing system and make them deeper and better. I have thousands of hours in the previous game, and I expect to spend at least that many in this third installment. All of the engrossingly flawed characters and stories of love, war, triumph, and loss that have already dynamically emerged from my playthroughs feel like just the beginning of something legendary. In fact, if I had to pick only one game to play for the rest of my life, the decision wouldn't be that difficult. A new king of historical strategy has been crowned. Long live the king! Back when VR first became a real thing and we all started spitballing about which game worlds we'd most like to be fully immersed in, Half-Life topped my list, tied with Bioshock. It took a few years, but Half-Life Alex has realized that potential, and it's the best VR shooter I've ever played. With it, Valve has set a new bar for VR interactivity, detail, and level design, showing what can happen when a world-class developer goes all in on the new frontier of technology. In a lot of ways, it feels like a game from the future, and one that the rest of VR gaming will likely take a good long while to match, much less surpass. The Last of Us Part II is a masterpiece worthy of its predecessor. Taking strides forward in nearly every way, Ellie steps into the spotlight and carries the sequel in a manner that feels like the culmination of everything that's made Naughty Dog's blockbuster storytelling so memorable. It delivers a layered, emotionally shattering story on top of stealth and action gameplay that improves the first game's mechanics while integrating a bit more of Uncharted's greater mobility and action. But while Part 2 is a thrilling adventure, it still makes time for a stunning, nuanced exploration of the strength and fragility of the human spirit. The PlayStation 4 has one of its finest exclusives in one of the generation's best games. Microsoft Flight Simulator is legitimately incredible. It's difficult to fully describe how amazing it feels to jump into a plane and just fly to and from literally any place in the entire world. The base game's 20 included aircraft feel like more than enough for even hardcore aviation enthusiasts. And the ability to tailor the experience to whatever skill level you desire makes it suitable for anyone looking to fly the friendly skies from the comfort of their homes. The real world mapping data, however, takes Flight Simulator from being just an impressive game to the most awe-inspiring and limitless simulation I've ever experienced, in spite of its less than stellar load times. Seeing famous landmarks, landing at the world's most recognizable airports, or just touching down in a remote landing strip in South America is mind-bogglingly cool and an absolutely unparalleled way to virtually explore our world. Overwatch is a one-of-a-kind hero shooter that is far and away the best of its genre. It offers variety, depth and style that very few come close to matching. Its four-year-old foundation has been lovingly crafted into the unparalleled multiplayer experience that it offers today. From its now-cherished characters, expertly crafted maps and outstanding sound design, it's a masterpiece of competitive gameplay. Most importantly of all though, it's never stopped being ridiculously fun after all these years. All of these factors combine to make Overwatch a singularly special shooter, and one that I would recommend to anyone without hesitation. Persona 5 was already a strong frontrunner for being the best JRPG ever made, and Royal really gets me wondering what else could even compete. The excellent story and its lovable multi-dimensional characters, along with the challenging tactical combat, are all refined and back for another round with new surprises and new friends in tow. There are new areas to explore and new twists to leave your jaw on the floor. Very little has been left untouched, and just about everything that has been touched is better off for it. The Phantom Thieves have stolen my heart all over again, and I don't really want it back. I wasn't sure what I wanted out of a sequel of Spelunky, given how high of a pedestal I keep the original game on. How do you improve upon a game like that? But Mossmouth took its time and managed to deliver a masterpiece that improves upon its predecessor in ways I never would have even imagined. 
Spelunky 2 takes everything that made the original great and expands upon each of those individual aspects without ever overcomplicating the elegant, retro simplicity of its 2D platforming. The possibilities for interactions between yourself, your enemies, and the environment are virtually limitless, which is a part of what makes every new run in Spelunky 2 so unpredictable and exciting. It doesn't do much to win over the people who already weren't fans of the original's unforgiving difficulty, but as someone who is more than 200 runs in and feels like he's only scratched the surface, Spelunky 2 is a game that I see myself playing for a long, long time. Man, those were great! Of course, there's no alpha without the Omega, so... Cooking Mama Cookstar is bogged down by monotony, poor motion controls, and nightmarish voice acting, while also having practically nothing new to offer. Whether it's the lack of consequences for failure, the incessantly obnoxious Mama, the bland cooking minigames, the lackluster multiplayer modes, or the complete absence of meaningful progression, Cooking Mama Cookstar is a tedious game that does almost nothing well. Going into Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered Edition, we expected a fair amount of old school design and weren't surprised to find that the story had been altered but we never anticipated it would be in such a frustratingly poor technical state on PlayStation 4. Unacceptable load times, lack of local co-op, and an arcane matchmaking system makes playing Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles a chore. A few simple quality of life improvements, even if it was just the removal or shortening of load times, would have gone a long way to gloss over at least some of Crystal Chronicles' shortcomings when compared to many other dungeon crawlers you can play in 2020. Unfortunately, the old school frustrations that weren't addressed only serve to date everything else about it, almost completely depriving it of any sort of fun. We'll be uninstalling it as soon as possible and never looking back. Aside from up-to-date squads, this season's kits, and a new start screen, FIFA 21 on Switch is virtually unchanged from FIFA 20, which was virtually unchanged from FIFA 19 before it, and outrageously priced at $49.99 or £44.99. If last year's release was borderline insulting, this year's is just plain disgraceful. EA, please do better. Under no circumstances should you play Wiggy. If you want guided meditation, there's plenty of free apps for phones and videos on YouTube. If you want to play a Souls-like, there's plenty out there, including actual Souls games. If you need a game with psychic powers, Control is a lot of fun. Avoid this at all costs and do almost literally anything else with your time. Yeah, we're going to try our best to forget about those. For more good games, though, be sure to check out all our picks for the best games of 2020, or if you want to look ahead, have a look at all the big games slated for release in 2021. For more on gaming's good, bad, and everything in between, you're already in the right place here at IGN.